So with the work with the AHDB Strategic Farm here in the east, we've been looking at cover crops over the last couple of years. We've been working with Essex and Suffolk Water, um, looking at nitrates um, by analysing what actual water comes out of drain outlets across the farm under a range of different crops and different cultivations. Cover crops have been talked about in the press a lot about their sort of value to um, nutrient capture um, but we will have to look at it in a farming system to see if it's actually delivering a benefit to the farm either economical or actual biodiversity and soil health. So there's a lot going on. We've been experimenting with different mixes um, over the last couple of years and we've done some work um, which um, ADAS have been analysing and Kate Smith will be um, explaining what results they found. So the trial last year was split over two fields. We had one field which was a stubble base um, trial, which half the field had a cover crop, half the field was left as a stubble. The other field was all ploughed in the autumn. We then established a cover crop behind the plough and then half the field was left as a plough. Each part of the um, four areas had a, a different drain outlet, which we could then sample with the Essex and Suffolk sampling system. So we could then see what nitrates and what other nutrients were being released. And so then we can make really good assumptions of what was being done through the winter. And then we planted spring barley in behind the, uh, the um, cover crop and the plough and the stubble. And then that was taken through in a normal farming system through to harvest. And then the yield data was um, analysed um, to see if there was any benefit or negative effect of the cover crop and the different cultivation systems. And it was quite obvious through the season that the cover crop actually for the last season being so we had a very wet, uh, wet winter and then a very dry spring and it sort of did hit the barley quite hard. One was through slugs um, in the cover crops um, behind the stubble. The stubble on its own was very good. The um, ploughed area actually was probably the highest yielding, just left as a plough over a winter. Um, and then the area of cover crop behind the plough, we had done so much work to get the cover crop established that when we actually planted the spring barley, it was very hard, it baked solid, and so we lost quite a lot of the seeds and the plant numbers due to pigeons and slug damage as well. So um, then that had a, a, a negative effect all the way through the season. Um, and the yield results pretty much show up that there's a negative effect where the cover crop was. Um, but then when you're looking at the actual soil disturbance, the earthworm numbers, where we hadn't disturbed it and where we had the cover crops, it was benefiting. So it's, if you're looking at it from a financial point of view, we had a negative effect. Where we're looking at it from a environmental biodiversity and long-term organic matter soil health um, angle, it was actually better to have the cover crop. So it depends on which camp you're in. Um, so from a farmer's perspective, when we look at the research that we saw, saw last year, it comes down to management of pests. Integrated pest management is a topic that's really widely talked about now. And um, when I look back at it, the slug pressure and the pigeons were something that I could have managed. Um, it was over a weekend, the crop came up, um, but then we saw that there was quite a, 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 a sharp increase in slug numbers in the cover cropped area but with the stubble and the slugs were actually working up and down the slot left by the drill and it was seed hollowing and grazing the complete leaf off which then caused the trouble um, with the establishment. Um, if I applied slug pellets I may have taken some out but to actually get the slug pellets into the slot was pretty hard to do um, and we actually ended up having to apply slug pellets but I don't know how much good it was in the long term so that was another cost added to those parts of the field. When you start looking at the pigeons, where the drill on the ploughed area, we had, we had created a really hard crust in the autumn. That then baked out as the conditions changed very quickly. We went from very wet soil to very dry soil very quickly. And so the drill then struggled to actually cut in. Should I have done another pass? Should I have pulled it up and, and cultivated it in front of the drill? Well, that would have been adding more money against that part of the field as well. So it comes down to risk management, risk of pests, risk of actually um, making money at the end of the day. There's a cost for the seed and the establishment of the cover crops. And then to actually have a negative yield um, effect actually makes it not viable um, for that year. So again, we're learning each year about cover crops. I'm gonna be persevering, 
The trials are going to be carried on for another year here at the Strategic Farm East. They're going to be looking at the fields, apple tree and blacksmith, looking at um, this year's crops, looking at this year's water outfalls and looking at soil um, assessments with the VES system, um, looking at structure and if there's any improvements long term over the two years um, that we've seen within this, um, this experiment. So I would say if you're interested in the long term effects, look at the maxi cover crop um, research that's been done by AHDB. Um, there's some great information in there. Talk to other farmers who are doing it. Look at different soil types, different mixes. There's so much to learn from cover crops. And it's something that I think long term is something that farmers have to embrace, looking at what's coming forward with elms and potentially more um, landscape environmental farming being the key to what we're looking at and how we can lower our inputs. And I see that this is one method that if we can integrate it with livestock like we're doing here, with sheep grazing them, um, it's going to be um, something that we've really got to learn and you only learn by your mistakes. Over winter Brian sampled drainage, the drainage water and we were able to compare nitrate concentrations in both fields from areas with and without a cover crop. And what we were seeing is that where there was a cover crop, nitrate concentrations were lowest and well below the uh, EC drinking water limit of 50 milligrams of nitrate per litre. In contrast, on the stubble, on the ploughed land, the, the nitrate concentration is much higher. Um, furthermore, we were noticing on the one-pass system, nitrate con concentrations were lowest um, or lower compared to the ploughed cover crop. And this really just ties in with, with the fact that the cover crop on the one-pass system was better established at the start of overwinter drainage. And this is consistent with what we're seeing in other research pro projects, that if you can get a cover crop well established at the start of overwinter drainage, you're going to have more impact at reducing nitrate losses over winter. So come the spring, in February, we, um, we took biomass samples of the cover crop and we found that both on apple tree and blacksmiths, the cover crops had produced a similar amount of biomass at, at between 1.4 to 1.7 tonnes per hectare. And this meant they'd taken up around about four to five kilograms of M per hectare. Um, we were seeing in the soil and Lorraine um, that there was indication of mineralisation over winter. We found that soil nitrogen supply was higher in the spring compared to the autumn by around 25 to 30 kilograms of M per hectare. Now, without the cover crop in place, this additional nitrogen would have been susceptible to being leached over winter. As Brian has explained, um, last year was really challenging for getting cover crops established. And um, we, um, we measured spring crop yields at harvest. And on apple tree, we saw that um, surface compaction due to drilling after the soil's been ploughed. So when it came to drilling the spring crop, it was really difficult to drill. And um, we were also seeing loss of seed due to pigeons. And so this combination of pest and drilling and, and, and soil compaction uh, resulted in a two tonne per hectare yield loss compared to the no cover crop, which um, had yielded around about eight tonnes per hectare. So overall, on both um, fields, we're seeing this around about a two tonne per hectare loss in yield following cover crops. And that's really due to the challenge of ploughing and drilling in wet soils and due to that pest damage that we were seeing. The take home messages from this trial are that if you can get a cover crop est established early, so drilling in early August or late August, um, you stand the best chance of it being well established and uh, reducing those surplus um, soil nitrogen so that we can reduce the nitrate leaching losses over winter. And the cover crop here is a, an example of um, how it can look um, in October when drilled by uh, in mid August. Be prepared for uh, variable impacts on yields. And this is something that was seen with the HDB Maxi Cover Crop project. And really cover cropping we need to have a long-term view and it's a, a long-term progress due to those um, variable yield, yield impacts on yield. In terms of uh, getting a spring crop established, the results from the, the one-pass system 
really showed that where possible it's important to leave a big enough window between uh, spraying off a cover crop and drilling the spring crop. You want to make sure that the soils are dry and, and warm before drilling that spring crop so that you can get ahead. And that was that is inconsistent with the results coming out of HD Maxi cover crop which found a 0.2 to 0.4 tonne per hectare yield losses in spring beans um, in clay soils where um, there was a short window between spraying off the cover crop and drilling the, the spring beans.